the Africa leaders at lectures in Dundee is um, this is going to be the third one, but we have had two, and we have benefited a lot from Malawi brains and strong knowledge. The first one was delivered in Dundee by Professor Sostin Chiota. Uh, we, we have uh, the pleasure to have him in the room. It was um, in November, and the theme was about impact on climate change in Lake Chilwa in Malawi. And um, maybe to just um, let you know that uh, Professor Sostin was awarded an honorary doctorate by the university. Then uh, the second one was in Accra. Since it's an Africa Leaders Lecture Series, it was in Accra, Ghana. And um, it was um, about drug discovery, um, which is a perfect, which is a collaboration that reflects the principles of the Blanchard Declaration for Procreation and Equitable Partnership, which underpins the Blanchard Declaration and has led to the Drug Discovery Hub at the University of Ghana, KNUST. So today, this is going to be our third lecture. And this lecture is um, being live streamed in Dundee. We have our staff in Dundee. We have um, the students also streaming live. Then we also have the general online audience all over the world, including Malawi. This is, um, as, uh, the, the team is big. One, uh, other people are here live, but most people are viewing online. So um, I'm proud to say that we have been working with Malawi Scotland Partnership, and we are honored to have the CEO, Stella Masangano, who is going to give us a brief overview about the work we have been doing with the Blanta Declaration, Malawi, and the University of Dundee. Thank you. May I invite Dr. Stella to come and do her work? Uh, thank you so much. Um, when you stand before individuals who have acquired excellence in terms of education, you miss words. So today, I have lost, I don't have anything to say. Anyway, <laughs> uh, my name is Stella Masangano. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Malawi Scotland Partnership. Um, I welcome you to this uh, event. I know you are busy people, but you've taken it, you've spared some time to come here and uh, be with us, to listen to the, um, to the lecture, and also maybe to discuss as well as to interact. Uh, let me give you uh, the background or some information regarding Malawi Scotland Partnership. Uh, Malawi Scotland Partnership uh, is a um, national aid network uh, that exists to coordinate, inspire, or motivate partnerships between Malawi and Scotland. Um, in 2005, uh, this was uh, born. Here in Malawi, we have Malawi-Scotland Partnership. In Scotland, we have Scotland-Malawi Partnership. What is it that we coordinate? We coordinate any interest that you have, that Malawians have in Scotland, be it religious, be it educational, be it business, any interest. So over a period of time, we have uh, several or several interventions that are happening between Malawi and Scotland. Uh, of interest uh, today is um, higher learning Forum. That is, uh, we have higher learning among other forums that we have, but of interest today is uh, the partnership that exists between uh, universities in Malawi and Scotland. Um, one would say, what is it that, that they do? There are several things that are happening uh, between universities of Malawi and Scotland, University of Glasgow, Strathclyde, the Med Aberdeen, so many universities. 
So in, I would say, as Malawi Scotland Partnership, we have a friend with a purpose. We have, over a period of time, worked together in many areas. But uh, last year, I got an email from my colleagues in Scotland to say, Stella, can you have a look at uh, this? When I looked at it, it was, uh, they had entitled it Blunder Declaration. I, I read it. I, it was, I think, one page or two, page, two pages. So it was um, the beginning of partnership between uh, public universities and University of Dundee. Then uh, following that, a team from Dundee came to Malawi. We went to Rwanda. Uh, there, we had interaction with the uh, professors, students from uh, Rwanda. Then uh, the team came down here. They went to uh, Chasa College. Then today, one year down the line, there are several things that have happened. Uh, I don't have to preempt, but uh, Professor Ian maybe will, will say some of the things that have happened. What I'll ask you today is to ask yourself, your colleague, and say, universities, why do they exist? Do they exist for us just to acquire the, uh, the papers that we have? In terms of research, what kind of research are we doing? Given the many, many challenges that we have in this country, or in Africa or beyond, we have climatic challenges, we have health related challenges, so many challenges in the agricultural sector, we have so many challenges. So the question that I'll pose to you, um, uh, highly educated people, is to say, what kind of research do we have to, uh, to execute? Because I, I think the people out there, the people in the village, the poorest, person in this country, they look up to educated people. They say, you went to school, we are looking forward for solutions from you. So those are the questions. As we partner with the University of Dundee and the many, many universities, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of um, partnership do we want to, uh, to, to, to have? What is it that we are going to resolve? Because out there, there are people that do undermine education because they haven't seen, uh, they are yet to see what is it that educated people are offering to, to the poor. So let me, at this point in time, uh, as we celebrate one year since uh, the Branda Declaration was um, instituted, let me say thank you and uh, let us look forward to a partnership that will commercialize ideas, will commercialize things to assist or to solve the many, many challenges that we Malawians are solving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella, um, for the great work you're doing towards developing Malawi and Africa at large. Just like we've been graced by Stella's presence, back in Dundee we have Mr. Stuart Brown, who is the interim chief executive of Scotland Malawi Partnership and also the, the, the meeting in Dundee is being coordinated by Professor Wendy Alexander, who is our Vice Principal International. So before we introduce our speakers, I would like to take this opportunity to invite the Vice Chancellor of the University of Dundee, Mr. Ian Gillespie, Professor Ian Gillespie, I'm sorry, to come and introduce the speakers. Thanks, Wendy. I know I'm the answer to Ian, so you're fine. Well, uh, hello everybody uh, here in Blantar. It's, um, it's great to be back. Uh, and hello also to friends and colleagues in, in Dundee. Um, I know we've got quite a number of people online, as others have said. I'm delighted that um, the uh, Member of Parliament for, uh, for Dundee, for Dundee City, is uh, uh, with us uh, in Dundee just now. And I think that just demonstrates the level of interest and support from Scottish Government, Scottish Parliamentarians and our own community in Dundee for uh, all that's happening here in Malawi and for our partnership. You don't want to hear too much from me. What you really want to hear from are our outstanding speakers. But let me just make a couple of very quick points. First is, as Winnie has said, this is the third 
of uh, our African lecture series, and tonight we get two for one, so that's even better. But it's also the anniversary of us signing the Blantyre Declaration, which is a declaration of equitable partnership between universities to drive forward what we think about as social purpose, great research, fantastic learning and skills development, and driving the economy and engagement with society. And we've done that, seven universities, six public universities from Malawi, plus the University of Dundee, uh, with common purpose, uh, with a 10-year vision. And we're hoping to match that 10-year vision up to some of the, the challenges, but also the huge opportunities around Malawi's 2063 vision and Malawi's national research agenda. And I'm delighted that tomorrow, uh, with my VC colleagues uh, from Malawi public universities, we have a workshop hosted by uh, Malawi's National Planning Commission around prioritising um, uh, action to meet the uh, national research agenda. <coughs> With that tomorrow, we have two particularly episode speakers tonight. First of all, Agri Ambala. Agri will uh, uh, start off, uh, and Agri is going to talk about the role of scientific priority setting, diplomacy and governance and strengthening research and innovation ecosystems. And this is a real balancing act, isn't it? How, how does one create priorities, but at the same time empower and enable universities to be really creative and agile? And Agri's shown great pan-African leadership around this with uh, 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 NEPAD, with the African Union, uh, as well as here in Malawi at, at UNIMA, and a particular focus around innovation systems and delivery. And I'm looking forward very much indeed in a second to your uh, remarks, I agree. And then secondly, we'll have uh, Richard, uh, Richard McCandewiri. Richard, uh, again, brings huge wealth of experience around coalitions of the willing we think coalitions of the willing, we all cringe, but these are coalitions of the willing to transform agri-food production, to transform the economy, to make people's lives better. That's something that we can all want to be part of a coalition uh, to deliver on. Again, uh, um, Richard's had uh, Pan-African, beyond Pan-African experience, uh, a long list of, of accolades. He's a professor at Luanar uh, Agricultural University here in Malawi. He also chairs uh, the National Planning Commission. So, uh, Richard, I hope you knew that we're having his workshop tomorrow morning uh, with, with your colleagues. We're looking forward to that uh, very much. So, two inspirational speakers, uh, two huge leaders here uh, in Malawi, two colleagues that I think we will all enjoy very much. And with that, I think, am I introducing? Let me take the initiative and introduce to you Professor Agri Ambali. Thank you very much, um, moderator and the, um, the vice chancellor of. See, I'm having to learn how to go through this list. So the first chance of investor of Dundee. Um, it's an honor to be here, and indeed, uh, I'm so grateful to those basically uh, who invited me uh, to be part of this uh, great evening. Uh, and indeed, I should first of all honor, uh, respect uh, the vice chancellors. Uh, again, bear with me. I have to be reading this. Camus uh, Investor of Health Sciences. Uh, Investor of Agriculture and Natural Sources. Wana. Malawi Investor of Business and Private Sciences. Mubas. Malawi Investor of Science and Technology. Mast. Zuzu University. Zuni. And University of Malawi. All I have done is I only went to University of Malawi, and that was all. So all these others are there to open message, basically. Uh, so pleasing. Uh, let me start by congratulating uh, uh, I mean, uh, you colleagues that are spearheading uh, this partnership uh, between Dundee and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the investors in Malawi. <coughs> and indeed, uh, for the great work that has come through uh, the partnership. Uh, my name is Agra Bari, as introduced. Uh, I serve as a senior advisor in the Office of Science, Technology, and Innovation 
at the African Union Women Agency, a union party. Um, my last employer, or my, my last but one employer, was in Vest of Malawi until 2003, uh, 2004. Uh, this evening I'll be speaking on the topic of shifting the center of gravity, the role of scientific research, a society project, project setting, diplomacy, governance in Central Africa's research uh, innovation ecosystem. The Central Innovation Ecosystem. Uh, let me start by indicating for the fact that uh, when I use the word science, it's not just the science that we know of science, but really uh, in the science world where we do science administration, science management, uh, science is every discipline. So even history is science for us. So please, just in case you feel that uh, I'm talking of only the natural and engineering sciences, actually even the arts are also sciences. Um, in this presentation, next slide, um, basically I would like to, uh, I'm not going to go into the science itself, but I would like to go into the subject of science leadership. I think uh, it's important because you are the science leaders, you are the people that are leading uh, research and innovation for this particular uh, country, and you are also contributing to the continent, in which case uh, I would like just to you know, have a chat over you know, a basic, basically, you know, the importance of building strong you know, systems, uh, you know, exploring the interplay between the scientific body setting and shifting the center of gravity, as well as the role of science diplomacy in international development. And the, when I've said all that, the success is that I hope I have advocated uh, for, the, for, for a strong science leadership uh, in the implementation of the national research agenda of the, Mal of, 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 of the Malawi 2063. Um, I'm going to start my professor here, who's coming in after me, uh, Professor Kapijab um, I sat in his class, I was his student, um, several years back. So it is an honor, and also he's, my, he's, he's been my colleague at the uh, AUD in Nepal, at, at Nepal, NPCA. Now, uh, just a brief next slide about the issue that I serve. As I said, I work for the African Union Development Agency, uh, which basically is the latest outfit. Uh, we've moved from Nepal Secretariat, uh, then we are Nepal Planning and Coordinating Agency, and now we are the African Union Development Agency. Being uh, the development agency that basically deals the matters of uh, you know, economic development within the architecture of the uh, African uh, Union uh, you know, uh, system. We've got five components of our mandate. One is to coordinate and execute broader regional and continental projects, uh, strengthen the capacity of AU member states and regional uh, bodies. We do a lot of that. Uh, we also advance knowledge-based advice support to AU member states and regional economic communities. And we do undertake resource mobilization on behalf of member states and for member states as well as serve as the coordinates technical interface uh, with different partners and stakeholders. So that's the, uh, basically what the issue that I work for uh, does uh, in as far as the mandate is concerned. Now, uh, let's get to the subject I'm talking about, which is basically, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, science, technology, and innovation. Within the architecture of the African uh, Union, uh, you know, science, technology, next slide, science, technology, sorry, that one, yeah. Science technology and innovation takes a very similar stage because you know these are believed to be the uh, or they are actually the engines of growth. Unless a country promotes innovation, uh, you know, dreams of you know development, dreams of growth uh, would be very far. So indeed, and that's why you know uh, you know you find that it seems like <coughs> the ones that are meeting here, you are the leaders of these institutions, you are actually the people that basically, you know, are running that particular engine of growth. Because if you look at it, most of the research, a good part of the research uh, in a country is carried out by the universities. Now, probably we spend most of the time uh, looking at different disciplines of science. But there's a component which is quite important, which is science leadership. Uh, it's just as important, you know, as, you know, looking at uh, your best publications, Know, the science of something or in the ideology of something, you know, 
it tends to be forgotten. But you know, uh, it's a very, uh, very uh, important uh, component. We are also in a, in a situation whereby, uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, the center of gravity basically has shifted. If you talk to the colleagues, uh, you know, uh, from the uh, you know, uh, you know, different countries, uh, they basically have understood that uh, you cannot do good research and innovation if you don't have the owners of you know a particular ecosystem define what the borders should be. So really, I think I'll be emphasizing on the importance of us in being proactive uh, in the definition of, of the priorities you know, that you want research for a country like this one uh, you know, to, to, to focus on. Now, within the African Union, we've got uh, what we call the uh, Science, Technology, and Novel Strategy for Africa, uh, STISA 2024. It's a 10-year strategy, which basically uh, you know, is uh, coming an end next year, and right now, a new strategy is being developed. Now, in this strategy, uh, the whole role is to really position science and innovation at, this, at the epicenter of Africa's social economic uh, development uh, and growth. Next slide. And what you find in TISA is that uh, we have got uh, what we call pillars and the uh, and broader areas. So what you see inside there, those are basically pillars. One is, you know, you need, you know, good infrastructure. Now we talk of infrastructure <coughs> and even ecosystem. It's infrastructure that it basically is the research infrastructure, but at the same time, even the backbone infrastructure, you know, is also the main. Uh, both are, are important. The second pillar is technical competence. Um, the whole issue of increasing local content in the conduct of, you know, uh, research and innovation uh, is very important. Uh, you find that in most of our countries, you know, for every dollar spent on a, you know, on, 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 on a road construction, probably 90 cents of it goes out of the country. Where we keep less than $10, this is 10 cents, uh, because most of the, you know, the content in there basically is from outside. The expertise from outside, you know, uh, the engineers are from outside, you know, but we need to change that. And that's basically what Steve is saying. And then the whole issue of innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's where probably I'll be talking about it at some point when, you know, when I look at basically what obtains uh, in this country, as well as an enabling environment. So basically, if you look at it, you see that I'm really focusing around the whole issue of unpacking the uh, enabling environment. Uh, basically, how do we look at it from you know, uh, a developing country uh, uh, context? And then uh, there are priority areas, food security, all the way up to uh, wealth creation around this. So this is the African Union uh, science uh, strategy. Uh, I got to the point of educating myself a little bit, and I would not want to say much because uh, Prof will be coming here and, uh, as the chair of the commission. But Malawi has a, a Malawi 2063 agenda. And uh, I had the opportunity of looking at the national uh, research agenda. Now, uh, according to the Malawi 2063, uh, there are three pillars that basically are supported uh, by seven by seven enablers. Now, I think this, uh, for most of you here, is common language. Uh, I'm having to educate myself over this particular agenda. You know, uh, now the national research agenda for the country is basically centered around these pillars and enablers. And what you find is that if you go into national research agenda for Malawi, you know, uh, against each of these pillars. And against each of these enablers, you have identified priority areas. Uh, you know, and you know, all that is, uh, is articulated, which is quite good. What tells me, in fact, I read through the primary pages that are in there, is that actually you did a lot of consultation to come up with, you know, with priority areas against the three pillars and against the uh, seven uh, enablers. I have some observations uh, that I'll bring up in as far as, you know, what I see in there as far as science leadership is concerned and advocacy for universities in the country working with their partners to uh, contribute to achieve, to actually delivering on this particular agenda. 
Now, usually in the implementation of science, you know, strategies like the STISA, we do have what we call governance architecture. There is the, the what we call the decision making structure, and there's the implementation structure. And I think this is where it's, it's important. The National Commission for Science and Technology of Malawi and other, the, the, the Department of Science and Technology of Malawi, those are the decision, make, decision making, you know, uh, you know uh, sort of structures uh, of your national strategy agenda. Now there's the impression structure of which the National Commission, working with the, uh, uh, working what? Working, working with the, uh, you, the universities, are part of the impression stru structure. Uh, I've used here an AU process whereby we've got, uh, you know, the African Union, uh, you know, commission, heads of state, we call those the decision making structure, and then we've got the implementation for which, you know, our institution, AUD and NEPAD, uh, plays a, a, a role. Now, I think this is where I would want to, you know, invite you, the vice chancellors, to be really positioning yourself as far as how do you look at your national research agenda? It's not the commission uh, that Professor Mkandawire, you know, uh, chairs that is going to implement that particular agenda. It's you, the vice chancellors, and your professors that are going to be there actually to implement that agenda. And you collaborate with your colleagues. In which case, my advocacy, and my role being with you is take your rightful position. And I think I want uh, to look into some, 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 some of those areas. Now, as I said, you know, the priorities I've identified, they are there in the national search agenda. Uh, but there are some key considerations you, you should look, look at when it comes to a research uh, leadership uh, our point of view. One is the pillars the pillar and priorities, if you look at them, I know, uh, you know, the Director General of the Commission is here, uh, you, know, um, you know, if you look at them really, they are quite high, le high level. And in there, the agenda is very clear. It's, it has identified further work to be done, as well as institutions that are supposed to articulate that agenda. Now, my question to the universities is, how have you placed yourself? or position yourself to actually provide leadership in that particular process. At the same time also, I mean, here we are, you know, there was a time when maybe the agenda for research and innovation in the country was coming from outside, the funders and what have you. But now everyone is saying no, sorry. The agenda has to be defined on the ground. And that's what, basically, they, what, they, that's, that's basically the movement, what's the, what's the movement, movement is. Fund, big funding agencies like Welcome Trust, you know, Gates Foundation, they will tell you that the agenda has to be defined from the ground. And I think this is where, you know, I would want to invite universities to really, you know, take that national research agenda, own it, and, you know, direct its, its, its implementation. Uh, Dr. Muntari is only a custodian of that particular strategy. He's not the implementer. In fact, you cannot hold him to book over that one. It's you, the universities, that actually shall be held to book as key people contributing to that particular agenda. I think I really want to impress upon you colleagues that you know, we need to take our rightful position as universities. And leadership is, is right here in here. You will tell us how much you are doing in terms of contributing to that. If, you have wrong, if, if, if my position is right, is wrong, the chair and his DG, they will tell me that no, apparently they are the ones who are implementing, but I say, say no, they are not the ones that are implementing. Now, in partnership, yes, Dandy University, or University of Dandy, in this partnership, congratulations, good job. But you know what? How are you in that partnership? Who's defining the research agenda in that partnership? I think this is where we need to take the rightful position. This is the era of co-creation and co-development. You know, co-creation and co-development. We all, I mean, Dandy has to, you know, come up with some ideas, but at the end, at the end of the day, you are the people, if it's here, the city is in Malawi, you are the people that are supposed to really address the issue, to really address those, those issues. So please take your rightful uh, uh, position. Now, this is called a national research agenda. I'm not very sure if the word use, use of the word research uh, 
is literally translated the way it is or it's just generic because again I think when you look at the innovation ecosystem uh, it's, I'm trying to talk about that particular word because I've not seen the word innovation in there. Not all innovations come from research. In which case, do not forget the, 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 the informal economy. You know, because a lot of innovations in a country like ours do come from the informal uh, economy. The Juakali industry, you know, uh, the people in Idirande, the people in all these places whereby the tradesmen and what have you. So I, it's my prayer that as you actually translate those, you know, pillars and the and what and the uh, and the and, 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 and the supporting, uh, you know, sort of like uh, elements, actually that you will not leave out those innovators that are not necessarily researchers. Not all innovations come from research, and this is very important for economies uh, uh, like ours. Now, I want to look at the issue of governance. I think it's nice, as I said, to have this kind of partnership. Uh, but again, I want to again uh, look at the issue of governance. How are we set ourselves to govern that partnership? It's a partnership in which case, you know, you got to meet each other halfway. You know, that's where the issues of now co-creation and co-development uh, come through. But even more important is the fact that when I read through, the uh, you know the what the 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 the, 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 the search agenda, uh, I would want really to encourage colleagues as you roll out those priority areas, look into the concept of regulatory science. I mean, co-evolution approach is very important. Development has got hand hand in hand with regulation. I think it was only in three of the nine pillars that are in the national search agenda where, where I saw you know, the role of regulatory, you know, uh, you know uh, processes. I would want to actually request, if possible, that as you will be rolling out that thing, in each one of those pillars and what have, what have you, please do not forget regulatory sciences. That's why you find that most of the times we've got innovations that are still stuck because the regulator was left out. When I'm talking of a regulator, I'm talking of the Marvel standards, I'm talking of, you know, uh, the, what, the medicine process board, we should not leave them out. Let's walk along with them as we do this. So it's not just a lot of discoveries, but also let's look at the, uh, the whole role of, uh, of uh, regulatory uh, uh, sciences. And the other thing, you as leaders, and it's so good that you have got this partnership with the, between Dandy and all the universities, is the nexus issues. You cannot just talk of agriculture these days on its own. Agriculture is part of health. Health is part of agriculture. You know, climate change. You know, uh, you know, uh, biodiversity. All those nexus, nexus issues have to be taken into account. So that was the kind of like, you know, I would say the content side of governance. But the other side of governance in leadership, which I really want to encourage my colleagues uh, as leaders in, the, in, your, your, in your universities, please define the rules of the game more clearly. What I have, what, what I would like to encourage you here is that. Uh, really, I think uh, uh, try to really see how you can manage research in your institutions. Sometimes it's the governance challenges that have really destroyed the research ecosystem in our countries. Uh, I know of how programs, big programs, have been lost just because of some conflicts, you know, among, you know, ourselves in some of these, uh, some of these institutions. So really, governance is, uh, is, is, is quite, quite, quite important. And then, you know, you as the, you know, as leaders of, 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 of innovation in the country, have you asked yourselves in terms of what role should play in as far as science advisor is concerned? Uh, the whole issue of advisors, who takes, I mean, how does the government get to know what you are doing? So there has to be someone who has to be informing government on what is going on. So the issue of science advisor should be, should be actually part and parcel of your advocacy you know, for, 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 for an innovation ecosystem uh, in this country. I, there could be a science advisor, well and good, but I think if there isn't, it's something that you should think, think through uh, very, very, very carefully. And then uh, science, also innovation, they are increasingly being integrated 
as part of the uh, you know uh, international diplomacy. Uh, you got you know you are seeing countries including science and innovation as part and parcel of the of, of what of their missions. I think it, uh, it's up to us as leaders of research and innovation in the country to really advocate uh, for the whole issue of science. You know uh, you know uh, being part and parcel of the uh, international dipl diplomacy uh, for our country. And of, of course, I mean the issue of uh, domestic R&D financing. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's not an issue of volume. It's an issue of mindset. Uh, most of our countries, I mean, there's no country that doesn't put money into research. Every country puts money into research. Even, 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 even those that you think they don't put money into research, they put money into research. But the volumes. Uh, this is work that was done by one of our uh, colleagues uh, on Kenya, Rwanda, where you see that in blue, I mean, that's external financing. And then the yellow is the domestic financing. And the gray is, uh, uh, is what? Is, 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 is for the financing gap. As we advocate for research and innovation in our countries, let us also work very closely with the domestic sources of financing. I think uh, the situation is not as bad as it might have been. I've been in this game uh, for some time now and I've seen shifts. One of the things that is emerging on the, on, the, on the continent is the whole, you know, kind of like, you know, sort of like emergence of national innovation funds. You see that a lot of countries are setting up national innovation funds. And even this country, okay, is setting up a national innovation, it has a national innovation fund. It is not that big, but it's the, it's the direction. It's in the right direction. Now the question is, you as such, such leaders, what role are you playing in advocating for that fund, in as well as utilizing that particular fund. Whatever we do, I think we have to, you know, uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that you know, uh, you know, there is some domestic financing that goes into research, uh, innovation in the country. However, I think we should be there to advocate for, you know, expansion in the volume of that particular uh, uh, financing. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, you know when I read through the uh, national research uh, you know uh, you know agenda, uh, Malawi has a national research fund. Professor Kaunda, as the uh, as the uh, as the chair of the uh, of what of the of the commission of the board of the commission, you know congratulations. Actually, the, the, you, you have a fund. It's not the size of the fund. You know, small as it is, every, every country that said a fund, they never started with a big, you know, fund. The small fund that you have. Please keep on working on it. You know, never go to the government and say you're not doing anything. Say thank you for whatever is going on. However, why don't you push it out a bit more? That should be the language. Yes, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no country that doesn't put money into 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 this. They do, you know, another. And then there's this other bit that we as such as also in in, in, in our countries are suffering from that. We are not actually doing proper, proper sort of accounting of how much is going on some of those places. So anyway, um, I didn't want to bother you too much with science, but we just touch on aspects of, you know, uh, of, you know, uh, <clears throat> looking at the whole issue of what sort of leadership should, you know, you uh, colleagues as leaders of universities, which are the centers of, you know, research innovation in the country, in the, I, I mean, uh, you know, you know do to help the situation. I think uh, we've got something here that will take us to actually, uh, you know, grow, and it is our responsibility. I thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Agri. I think I cannot agree less that this has been very insightful. If we want to develop as a continent and Malawi, we need to look at science, innovation, and technology and incorporate it. So, uh, Professor Ian. Uh, I would like to request you to invite our next distinguished speaker. Thank you, Winnie, and uh, uh, Agri, all I can say is um, you're clearly a spy because you've been looking at my slides and my presentation for the <laughs> NPC thing tomorrow morning. And even if you haven't, I've been copying as you've been going. 
brilliant, brilliant, brilliant evocation. Uh, so much wisdom in that, and so much that, that I know colleagues will have listened to and uh, will, have, will have chimed with them, particularly that issue about, about empowering responsible, you know, who, who's actually got the, the, well, the responsibility, who's the actor that is to drive these things. Uh, incredibly strong, incredibly strong. And uh, a great lead, of course, into Richard. Um, and what I didn't realize is that you know, Richard was uh, uh, your, well, your, your, your mentor, your supervisor, your professor. Uh, and of course, uh, those in Dundee can't see that he's sitting next to uh, Sos and Chota, who I always think is mine, actually, but also my brother in arms. But Richard, this is about you. Richard Bikandawiri. Richard, please come and uh, present to us. I know that you're going to be just as inspiring as I agree and build up for uh, a fantastic Q&A. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, the Vice Chancellor of uh, the University of Dundee, uh, colleagues, uh, Vice Chancellors from our public institutions gathered here, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Agri Ambali. Uh, yes, uh, he was in my class, um, but uh, definitely he's a colleague now, and uh, we work together in the NEPADA agency. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see the great work you're doing out there. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, my Director General, uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Chetagarala Montali, who is here. Uh, it's a pleasure that uh, you came with uh, your colleagues. Uh, indeed, uh, all of us would like to pay attention to, you know, Malawi 2063, and would like to welcome the input of uh, our institutions of higher learning. They're so central. Uh, I wish we could actually engage you a little more deeply than now we have done so far, because uh, you are the, you know, generators of our, you know, knowledge, technologies, and thinking. Um, in my remarks, you notice that uh, I continuously continue to emphasize on the need for radical thinking and uh, being transformative in our thinking, uh, thinking out of the box, uh, generating new knowledge that are really is there, but somehow we seem to be failing to get it across to implementers, and uh, therefore I think this engagement with uh, particularly the National Planning Commission will be extremely uh, important. I believe uh, we we're told that uh, we have a uh, Member of Parliament from uh, Dundee. Uh, you're, you're very welcome, uh, Honourable Member of Parliament. Uh, it's a pleasure to see such uh, high-level government officials from out there, uh, particularly uh, the fact that uh, you know, we've had a long association ourselves as Malawi with uh, Scotland. Um, my own uh, doctor was Dr. Petre. Uh, I was born in Zomba, and uh, you know it was a Scottish doctor who, you know, gave me the name Richard. And uh, I've got deep association with uh, Scotland in that regard. Uh, I also noticed that uh, we have uh, the Attorney General, uh, Honourable Chakaka Yurenda. Uh, you're welcome, uh, and I believe, uh, you know these uh, engagements and the, the kind of issues which uh, I would like to, to, to address also uh, need uh, some uh, legal minds uh, to reflect upon. Um, therefore, my focus, as you rightly uh, you know, know, is around building coalitions of the willing in transforming African uh, food systems. Um, but also, I would like to reflect on uh, lessons for Malawi in that uh, particular presentation. So I would like to raise uh, you know, mainly three issues. Uh, the first one is that, uh, you know, African and global development institutions, including universities and research institutes, are unlikely to make an impact on the ground in transforming African food systems unless they become part of a coalition of willing partners. And this is why, you know, we welcome the University of Dundee as a willing partner to engage with us. But more importantly, it's about aligning that partnerships to nationally defined plans and implementation processes. And again, this is why we're delighted that uh, everybody is actually talking to the well-defined Malawi 2063. And uh, therefore, all partners in this country 
um, donors included, uh, but also every citizen, if they're talking about development, they must align to this uh, nationally defined implementation process. Secondly, I would like to argue that uh, public institutions are inherently incapable of transforming food systems and reforms in the absence of compelling evidence and collective uh, pressurized voices that are informed by research. This need for ensuring that, uh, you know, we, 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 we need sometimes you know, pressurized voices, a collective voice, a range of voices to really uh, facilitate change. And th finally, I want to conclude by appealing to national researchers in Malawi to reach out across geographical boundaries and disciplines in addressing uh, countries' food systems and challenges. Malawi's food systems, but also other countries' food systems. And in my conclusion, a note that uh, Global North institutions, such as uh, the University of Dundee and others, which bring in new research perspectives, drawn from uh, other regions of the South, are important. I went to the University of East Anglia uh, in Norwich at the School of Development Studies, and uh, I was amazingly you know, surprised that uh, many of my colleagues at that university were doing research in Nepal, in India, Chandigarh, and in all these other uh, countries in the south. Uh, Malawi doesn't do work in Chadiga in India. Um, and I believe University of Dundee you know, works with other countries in the global south. And I think those uh, perspectives can be very helpful in understanding those perspectives. That's why these partnerships are important. But in any case, I think in these uh, coalitions we're talking about here, I think we need to tap on the best of uh, the global knowledge it doesn't matter where it comes from. Uh, it could be from Russia. It could be from, uh, you know, the UK. It could be from, uh, you know, Greenland. But the base of the knowledge is what we need to tap on. And I think that has been wanting in drawing on uh, that global knowledge. Sometimes we get to be overzealous and say, no, 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 we must actually drive our own agenda. Yes, that's important. But also, you know, let's tap on the base of the knowledge. And, and again, we'd like to welcome the contributions of our uh, University of Dundee uh, in terms of sharing knowledge, sharing your experiences with uh, our colleagues in Malawi, with all of us. And uh, we trust that uh, in our tomorrow's conversations with uh, the Vice Chancellors, we will actually begin to define some concrete opportunities for this collaboration. Um, you know, one of the challenges, you know, um, we face, and uh, indeed my colleague, uh, Dr. Professor Mbali here also faces, is uh, these conversations sometimes lead nowhere. We just talk, and then uh, we actually say goodbye, and uh, we will actually meet again to talk. Uh, for how long are we going to talk? I mean, we need, I think, to move into action. Uh, so we're very keen, I was talking to my Director General that, uh, you know, tomorrow, as we engage our Vice Chancellors, would like to be a little more concrete and define what does this partnership mean on the ground? Um, you know, how are we going to be supported by the universities in Malawi to really uh, spin the needle to a different level uh, in Malawi in terms of all the challenges we are confronted with. Uh, so that, that's extremely important. So in, in my very, very uh, short lecture, my departure point uh, is the agency in transforming African uh, food systems. Because the current picture across Africa is not rosy. To begin with, uh, all of us know that uh, food insecurity and hunger and malnutrition are still rampant across Africa. Africa is a net exporter, uh, a net importer rather, uh, of uh, um, food, uh, importing about 85% uh, of food, leading to an annual import bill of almost 35 billion. Um, and many, as many as uh, 46 million Africans are hungry and 282 million Africans are undernourished. Uh, incomes, particularly for the rural areas, is still very low. In Africa, 52% uh, of the people live in rural areas and earn part of their livelihoods by working in the food systems space. African leaders, therefore, uh, including our own leaders in this country, should treat 
the need for transforming food systems as an emergency. Many of us who work in this space, you know, including when I was in Nepal, our commitment is to look at this challenge, the challenges Africa is facing, you know, as very serious, as an emergency. Uh, and therefore, it calls for a Marshall Plan type of intervention, you know, where particularly our leaders should be in the forefront of driving that Marshall Plan. I think many, many of our, our colleagues um, you know, across Africa, I'm talking again, you know, academic colleagues, they tend to be disheartened in terms of uh, the gravity of the problem that uh, you know, sometimes they wonder whether our leaderships across the board, not just the presidents, ministers and others, whether they're serious in responding to the challenges of food insecurity, uh, to the challenges that are uh, are actually slowing us down. The challenges that have made Africa an island of poverty uh, in the midst of our global prosperity. And in our own country, we always lament the fact that uh, you know, our neighbors are moving on. Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, they're moving on. How can we remain you know, behind? when we see prosperity in the neighboring countries. And I think we are challenged, I think as universities, to really look at this as an emergency, and therefore we need to take action. But that action cannot just be taken by the universities. It needs, as I said, collective voices that are committed to changing the deep-rooted political, economic factors that constrain to the creation of a healthy and sustainable food systems. And therefore, this will call for engendering collaboration and communication across geographical boundaries, disciplined sectors across governments, businesses, civil society, people, organizations, and scientific community. So this coalition is what we need and I think the challenge always is how do you build those coalitions of the willing? How best can you use these coalitions to drive change and transformation? And I wanted just to give you a very quick illustration on uh, how that might be achieved. But I just want to give uh, an example of very personal experiences um, I encountered when uh, I was actually leading uh, in uh, driving the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program of uh, the African Union Commission. I think as most of you know, uh, the African uh, Agriculture Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, uh, you know, is regarded as uh, uh, an African uh, blueprint in driving food systems and agriculture transformation. But uh, I wanted, you know, just to, to, to alert colleagues that uh, in spite of, uh, you know, the well uh, uh, recorded statements about uh, how uh, CADAP, as we call it, has actually performed, it is not actually, you know, an activity or a framework that uh, was readily accepted by the international community. It was not a framework that was readily accepted by governments. It was not a framework that was readily accepted by donors. It had to take a lot of uh, engagements and a lot of persuasion and a lot of uh, building of these coalitions that are you know, led to exerting pressure on discerning voices to accept it as the blueprint for transforming African uh, food systems what we actually uh, did was, um, first of all, we realized that a handful of individuals, about 10 of us, were no match with uh, you know, big global institutions like FAO and bilateral agencies. Uh, and therefore, we had to find a way of uh, looking around among the international community, 
strong voices that uh, could render us some support. And we, we, we sat down as, you know, with them as individuals. You know, so the personal angle cannot be ignored in building these coalitions. You, know, you identify who are these strong people, who are these strong voices from USAID, from World Bank, um, from uh, you know, all these bilateral institutions. Who are they that uh, can really give you the push? Uh, so, so we managed to convince a few individual you know, uh, colleagues from the international community, including, of course, some of the CG centers, those of you who work in the agriculture systems, um, who were convinced that uh, you know, they could actually join us in uh, building momentum around uh, you know, this agenda, which uh, was considered as African-led and African-driven. Um, you know, sometimes what is disheartening is that uh, even colleagues sometimes you're working with on the same, you know, agenda also can object to a very well-meaning, you know, intervention. Uh, those of us who work on the ground, even in this country, we know very well that, uh, you know, individuals introduce excellent, you know, uh, interventions, but you find there's opposition from a number of quarters and you wonder, you know, why would somebody, you know, there's evidence here that this could be the, you know, change we're seeking, but then you find there's opposition, you know. So, so how do we, I think as scientists, as universities, you know, influence change, influence buy-in into our priorities? So in our case, we engage Lucky enough, we had the resources to do that. Regional economic communities, we thought these are important because at the regional economic community level, such as SADAC, ECOWAS, and the East African community, this is where ministers meet and uh, they exert pressure, they actually make decisions. So if there's buy-in from a regional economic community, we realize that uh, we could actually win this battle. You know? So we managed to get funding for regional economic communities to be part of uh, this uh, process. But beyond that, we felt that uh, you know, we needed to build uh, a very large coalition, and therefore we set up uh, what we call a CADA partnership platform, a platform for continuous engagements. Sometimes, again, you know, colleagues sometimes feel, oh, you know, you, you, you're uh, just a platform. You know. Yeah, but platform, there's a place in science, there's a place in agriculture food systems in setting up a platform, a community of practice that will not only generate a new body of knowledge, but also will influence decisions. So sometimes, again, these platforms are important. So we set up that platform that uh, was actually created for the purposes of uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, whether it's the development agencies within their own, you know, systems, uh, institutions, USAID and, uh, you know, um, the UK, you know, um, at that time, DFID and, uh, you know, uh, GIZ and all of them, within their own systems, they would be our uh, champions out there. Uh, so no wonder uh, if uh, you look at some of these statements of coming out of uh, the then G8, CADAP was actually featuring in those uh, you know, conversations at the G8 level because uh, we had managed to sell it to these uh, you know, individuals. And at the country level too, we began to set up these uh, desks you know, uh, on CADAP. So again, from the country level side, there was actually that uh, support. So wh what is the message here? I think the message is that uh, the power of uh, social networks and coalitions are very important in, trans in moving towards transformation. You know, and these networks are the ones which we need, I think, to begin to build. But within the context of that, uh, we'd like to say uh, we cannot, of course, ignore the, 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 the power of our government. Uh, they are important. Um, you know. uh, so even within governments, who are the allies in governments? We need to identify them. And they're there. You know. In this country, especially, you know, if you listen to some of the debates in parliament, uh, if you listen the voices of some of the ministers, it's very clear that uh, you know, there are individuals there who are committed to genuine transformation of this country. But we need to identify them, very intentionally identify them, and bring them on board. Colleagues in science and technology, you know, 
which are the strong voices in government there, so that uh, we rope them in, you know, we meet them one on one and have conversations and say, this is the direction we want to move into. We think that this will make a difference. Some of these bills, again, Attorney General, some of them, you know, people are saying, no, they don't make sense. Um, please, I mean, again, the scholars who are here, you know, get to the Attorney General, get to some of the, you know, ministers and tell them, you know. I think our greatest challenge as Malawi is that uh, we're brought up in this uh, environment which is very hierarchical uh, and very authoritarian in many ways and sometimes very punitive. I think, you know, we need to be radical, but if you're radical and you're committed to transformation and you're armed with evidence, things can happen. You know, this is what I've personally learned, that, uh, you know, if you're armed with a solid team, solid alliances, and, uh, you know, you, you raise issues, sometimes very thorny issues, you know, there, there will be support. But I think more critically also is the question of bring on board civil society organizations. They're very instrumental to transformation of our economies, very instrumental in decision making, very instrumental in changing the status quo. We saw in the follow-up to the elections the role of civil society organizations but very often we don't bring them on board. We need to democratize our research and data and information by ensuring that our civil society organizations are not just uh, you know, targets for research and uh, change, but they need to be part of the change process. They need to be part of the research process. To what extent do we consider in our research that uh, from the conception of research up to implementation, dissemination, these civil society organizations are part and parcel of our own research agendas. That's part of the challenge, because we cannot claim as researchers, as scientists, that we have monopoly of knowledge. These individuals, these communities, are very central to generating knowledge. We need, I think, to uh, bring them on board. And certainly, uh, we need to bring on board, as I intimated, um, the international community. Uh, I know now everybody is talking about localization. Professor Mbali alluded to that, that, uh, you know, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, these initiatives are homegrown and driven. But uh, at the same time, we need to realize that uh, out there, there's a worth of knowledge, the worth of very, you know, willing partners who would like to be part and parcel of our efforts in transforming our economies, and in our case, Malawi, um, the food, you know, crisis. And indeed, let me, in my conclusion, say that uh, this country, I think, is going through an unprecedented food systems crisis. We're all aware that uh, tobacco is no longer the luring gold that uh, generated a lot of forex. And everybody is talking about diversification. The Director General and uh, the Mwapata Policy Institute are organizing a conference uh, next week on the need for looking at uh, how do we generate more forex through diversification, particularly of the agriculture sector. I think we need to address that challenge. But more equally, I think we need to address the challenge of uh, population growth. Malawi is, uh, you know, moving towards uh, almost 20 million people now. And it's projected that uh, by 2050, there'll be almost 45 million Malawians in this country. And if you just look at uh, the land size, particularly for smallholder farmers who have uh, no more than, on average, 0.4 of a hectare, you wonder, would they really be able to transform their lives? Would they be able to be the generators of the wealth we're seeking? What about, you know, innovations 
What about uh, radical thinking, generating new knowledge? We put that on the table and working with uh, these uh, coalitions I spoke about. That's where to go. Where's the new knowledge? It will come from uh, you colleagues, from uh, our own institutions of higher learning. It will come from uh, our own civil society organizations. It will come from uh, our global partners. And therefore, my call is uh, let's be radical in our thinking, let's be innovative, let's think out of the box, but let's work with uh, the international global community to be part and parcel of uh, moving towards uh, transforming our agriculture food systems uh, in this country and in Africa. I thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Richard Mkandawire. And uh, we must all agree that the past one hour has been very productive and very insightful. And being a room full of decision makers, I'm sure the ball is in our hands to pick up all the strong points that have been made and implement. So um, I think we shall go straight ahead to our Q&A session because I know we have a very engaged um, audience online and both here, and you must have a lot of questions for our key speakers. So there, there's a mic going around. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand and we shall bring the microphone over to you. Thank you. Does silence mean you're still digesting? I should give you time. <laughs> All right, we have questions. Thank you. There we go. Um, <clears throat> thank you to both uh, uh, lecturers. They were truly brilliant and, and uh, truly inspiring. And also thank you to uh, University of Dundee for uh, bringing together the, the collaboration and actually moving forward with it. Uh, my name is uh, James Urbinski. I'm a medical doctor, uh, professor of medicine, um, University of Toronto, and also uh, York University in Canada. Um, I was particularly inspired by um, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard's uh, presentation. And I would like to ask uh, Richard uh, uh, if he would um, trying to localize a, a place within a Malawi government uh, where the kind of leadership that you're talking about uh, might emerge. Uh, and could that, uh, uh, is that actually um, the National um, uh, Planning Commission? Is that actually the place where uh, the type of leadership that you're talking about might actually be properly catalyzed? And how might that uh, relate uh, very concretely to the six universities uh, that are gathered here uh, under this uh, under this partnership. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think that's a very good question, but I, I wanted to turn to the Director General of the National Planning Commission to respond to that question because uh, it's extremely important indeed to identify what is the entry point. Um, I, I, I don't want to put too much on us on him to claim that uh, the National Planning Commission is the entry point, but uh, he engages, I think, most of the, um, you know, leadership, particularly, you know, the, the, the government uh, leaders, PACs and uh, other you know, high-level officials, um, in as much as we also engage uh, uh, the ministers as well as uh, the president, um, uh, we have actually met some of these uh, political parties, for example, as now we're moving towards, uh, you know, the next uh, elections. Um, the National Planning Commission is supposed to endorse their manifestos, and we've made it very clear that, uh, you know, we are actually neutral um, or in fact, the Attorney General is here, in terms of the act of uh, which later was the establishment of the commission, is very clear that uh, 
we have actually the mandate to, to engage, to call upon uh, ministries, to call upon ministers, indeed to call upon uh, our president and say, you know, things are going wrong here. And we have actually engaged even our leadership and say, you know, very politely and very respectfully to say, you know, uh, the direction which, uh, you know, is emerging, uh, drawing, of course, on the board of knowledge that is available from uh, our colleagues um, to say, you know, this actually will lead us nowhere if, if we take this route. But I, I, I think the DG, um, uh, Dr. Thomas Montali, I think I, you, you can intervene here. No, actually, Chair, you've responded very well, so I don't know uh, what I should say. The beauty is when I spend lots of time with you, I've ended up getting your thoughts, so whatever you're speaking is. No, but I, f I fully agree with what, what you've said, unless he, he's got some uh, something to add on top. But I think it's very clear on what he's pointed out. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. We have another question. There's a hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's first uh, hear from Professor Ian. Uh, th thanks, sir. And the OECD, too. So, um, ministers, uh, the education, three, agriculture, and the Not for me, it's for the site. But I can genuinely tell you that I don't have that many conversations with my ministers in Scotland. And Scotland is a smaller and uh, this is not working. Is that, no, it's not working. So Scotland's a smaller country and uh, as well as representing the University of Dundee, I lead for all of the 19 universities in Scotland in, uh, in discussion with ministers. So as far as I can see, as you made in your comments, there, there, there is an ear out there with uh, uh, many ministers. For, for me, I come back to actually Agri's point earlier, what are we as university leaders going to do in, in helping put an, an, an agenda together? Your coalition of, a willing, of the willing, Richard, I think we're willing, but are we, are we stepping up to deliver? Thank you for those powerful comments, Professor Ian. We have, we have another comment. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, uh, really brilliant but powerful messages to us, and in particular from the University Fraternity. Uh, I wanted just to comment on uh, Professor Agriambalis and also to get a sense of direction uh, which universities should align themselves. Here we are, a coalition of six, seven universities, six in Malawi, one in, um, um, in Scotland, and uh, you have brought in very interesting aspects of uh, international or national or regional um, frameworks like STIZA, uh, which was joined. But sometimes there's a disjoint between us universities to align with continental uh, issues. I, I wanted really you to point out from your experience uh, how can we align ourselves. Uh, here we are we're discussing ideas, brilliant ideas. Yes, there is domestic resources, but also I know your experience. You've been very successful at mobilizing um, uh, international resources. Uh, so can you give a shed a light on how, uh, as a coalition, uh, using the word of Professor Kandawiri, as a coalition uh, of the willing, uh, align ourselves to ensure that uh, we can deliver on what we want to do. Thank you. So just for clarification, Professor Emmanuel, is that a question for yes, Professor Mbali? Okay, all right. Professor Mbali, is a question for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaunda, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Rwanda. Um, you know, I worked. I, I worked in the university, Malawi. Um, and then he, 
I became a civil servant of the African Union. Uh, my experience, even from what Prof. Mkanda was talking about here, CADAP, probably more often than not, CADAP is least, is least understood in the universities than anywhere else. Well, in fact, universities out of Africa understand CADAP more than our own universities in Africa. And this cuts across all the various frameworks. The same may be true. In fact, the same could be is true in this country. How many university lecturers understand the national research agenda that is there? Not even talk about Malawi 2063, but the contents. There are three pillars, seven or seven enablers. Mr. Vice Chancellor, just send a small kind of like, you know, survey. How many of your faculty members have kept pace with what that means? How many of the faculty members even know the role of the National Planning Commission? If things have changed, well and good. But uh, what I know is that we don't make an effort. So what actually I was trying to say well, is, please consume what you produce. If you have Malawi 2063 as your agenda, no can you please put in the forefront of your planning in fact, what I said is there is the element of co-creation and co-development. University of Dundee tomorrow is having a meeting with National Planning Commission. I mean, uh, uh, when have the universities in Malawi had a meeting with the National Planning Commission? I would be happy to know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ambali. As I told you, we have an audience in Dundee. So, just uh, let's switch to pick their questions and we can come back for balancing. Sure. Thank you. Uh. Thanks very Peter? much, Winnie, very much. Living the, uh, the principle of co-creation, a very engaged audience in, in Dundee. And we have several questions. The, 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 the first question that I'm going to address at this time comes from uh, Chris Law, who's the MP for uh, Dundee West. And, and his question is, what active steps are being taken in Malawi to engage more with parliamentarians to set policy for the NPC and indeed other uh, statutory bodies? So I suppose that's for you, Prof. Richard. <laughs> to respond to that. <laughs> right. Right, I, and I, I, it seems I cannot run away from these questions now. Uh, but I think that's a very important uh, question by the Member of Parliament. Uh, we, uh, by nature of the uh, act, the act that establishes the National Planning Commission, we do have a dual uh, reporting mechanism uh, that reports to the President, but also to Parliament. So there is a, a constant engagement uh, with the parliament uh, and from time to time we have engagements with the relevant parliamentary committees depending on the policies that are being put in there and um, uh, because the Malawi 2063 has got those three pillars and seven enablers which require uh, to be supported by various pieces of acts and uh, policies Whenever these are being uh, are put forward to Parliament, there's usually an interface with the National Planning Commission uh, so that we give our input in terms of whether we think certain elements in there are worth taking forward or not. And uh, proactively also being uh, in the forefront in reviewing some of the policies and bring to the attention uh, of parliamentarians, especially if it's uh, to do with the laws, uh, those that touch on the acts that have to and come up. So uh, I think that's what I can respond. There is a very active engagement, uh, uh, both proactive but also parliamentarians do engage the commission from time to time depending on what is coming up. Thanks. Thank you, DG. Uh, the second question from Dundee is from Stuart Brown, who, who many of you will know is the interim chief executive of the Scotland Malawi Partnership. This is also for you, th this is for you, Professor Richard. And Stuart's question is, what do you think of homegrown school feeding programs in Malawi 
which have benefit from concerted effort from NGOs, but are focused locally and the impact that they have. Well, that's a very specific question to, uh, well, of course, education. I mean, school feeding programs are important, no question at all. Um, you know, because again, you know, Malawi, as we said, is going through some very serious uh, food crisis. And many of uh, the children going to school sometimes, uh, you know, go to school hungry. Uh, and definitely, school feeding programs go a long way towards, uh, you know, uh, sustaining uh, th their nutrition, um, you know, providing support so that they can pay attention to learning. Um, there are, I think, a number of uh, school feeding programs running in the country, uh, but homegrown school feeding, um, my understanding is, uh, you know, allowing the communities themselves probably to generate the, the food and uh, let that food, you know, be fed in those local communities. Um, again, that's part of, a, you know, uh, innovative thinking that is required. You know, in fact, right now we're in discussions uh, with uh, the Mwapata Institute to begin to explore also on uh, this question of uh, um, promoting indigenous crops. You know, one of the greatest challenges, um, I know I lived in South Africa for close to 20 years and uh, I know how, you know, young people there, you know, consume so much of Coca-Cola and, uh, you know, starch, bread, I mean, you know, you see a young man over lunch hour, you know, eating bread for lunch and with a big bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, is that the kind of you know feeding we're talking about for for, for you know our, our children? Um, so what kind of food uh, is it sufficiently balanced? You know, what about moving towards uh, you know uh, promoting indigenous crops, indigenous foods? You know. Um, I and my family have moved on to eating sorghum and sima because uh, we understand sorghum is more nutritious than, uh, you know, the white maize, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, increasingly in Zambia, there are restaurants which are promoting, you know, these indigenous uh, foods as well. Uh, and I think we need to find ways of, uh, you know, generating that evidence and probably begin to promote those uh, indigenous uh, foods, uh, particularly, you know, beginning to change, you know, consumer interests of, uh, you know, young people uh, so that they do not just, you know, depend on uh, the, the, these, uh, you know, hybrid maize varieties, uh, flour from hybrid maize varieties and so on. Uh, what about indigenous foods, indigenous crops, but also involve communities to be the providers of, uh, you know, food, uh, you know, particular food for, for, for children in the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mkandawire and the Dandy team for the powerful questions. We shall now switch to the audience here. We have quite a number of hands. So uh, we shall start from the back, then we come to the front. Thank you. Thank you for the platform. I'm Karen Chinkwita Kumakanga, Director, Malawi Scotland Partnership. And um, it's a pleasure to see the partnership coming to this um, table and discussing the opportunities that are there. Um, my regards to the Vice Chancellor of the University of Dundee and everybody present. Um, it's interesting when we come to sit here and we talk of social networks and connecting internationally and connecting locally. I was thinking to myself that there is a, a group of a very large social network that could be helpful to us in this room you find that when we're implementing these technologies, um, whether the agriculture technologies, food systems, local technologies, you find that across Malawi, there's a very strong church network. Well, I can say faith network, because we're not only talking about the Christian church, we're talking about the Islamic um, network here in the southern region. We're also speaking of the traditional network that is there amongst the chiefs and the locals. Have we found a way to put together perhaps something simple that can bring these leaders up to speed to help support the networks that they have. Because already in every church, to speak of uh, familiar ground, there's a women's guild, there's a youth network, there's a children's ministry. Is there a way we're bringing these leaders 
into the education system and also upskilling them as they're working with the local communities. So that was my first question. It could go to both professors. My second question, um, Professor Agri, you touched on a very uh, a topic that's very close to heart, the Joakali. Uh, there was a Dr. Cornelius Mwaluanda who wrote the Joakali schemes that is now promoting the Tanzania and Kenyan um, social development. I was wondering if we have looked for a way, I know Mzuz University has worked on a way to help young entrepreneurs and innovators that are coming up with um, solutions outside of the university, but is there a way that if there is a great innovation, and I know our CEO Stella has come across some of these, is there a way to help them duplicate skill and have access to market? That's to you, um, Professor Ambali, if you've seen uh, examples of this before in other universities and other networks, how they're helping those outside of the academic system. Thank you very much. Over to you, Professor Ambali. Thank you very much, Director. Um, I think he basically, you know, that's why I say that, you know what, I hope the national research agenda, the word research is not retro in terms of you know, defining boundaries as to how that agenda should go. Because uh, when it comes to innovation, as I said, not all innovations come from research. And this is where you find that the uh, informal communities, uh, you know, they, they become very handy. In fact, we basically know that a lot of innovations, even in this country, uh, you know, they are out there. They come from uh, those. Uh, I mean, uh, those uh, the, 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 the informal sector. So that's why I was trying to say that you know what, we need to make a deliberate effort to harness that constituency as well. We cannot plan our innovation, you know, uh, ecosystem in this country, you know, without including, I mean, uh, the informal, uh, you know, uh, communities. I don't want to include the faith-based commission. Uh, 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 institutions into this, but what I'm trying to say is that at least the informal sectors, you know, uh, they need to be brought on, on, on board. Uh, they are quite important. Now, I think he, uh, there are several efforts of trying to actually uh, recognize or try to or promote the informal sectors. And I think this is where, you know, uh, I was saying that, you know, uh, or I'm saying that, you know, uh, we really need to domesticate our, our plan. Uh, we know of cases, I know that, you know, sometime 2001, 2002, I chaired the uh, MIRTDC, uh, my industrial Social and Technical Development. Uh, and and there are places in Dira and what have you. I mean, there are all these veggie bicycles and what have you. I mean, those are actually, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, you know, innovations from, you know, from what, from, 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 from what, from, from, the informal sector, you know? So the issue is how do we grow that? And this is where issues like those, I think he, that issue still, still exists in a different way. I, I don't know why, why, what it is called now. It, but you see, those, you know, uh, the issues that, that support uh, those, uh, those, kind of, uh, those kind of processes. I can't give you a specific example for Malawi. I'm sorry to detach. Uh, I hope that I should catch up on, on, on that aspect. Um, the faith-based communities, uh, you know, they are just as important. And the, uh, this is where you find that, you know, they play a very key role in the innovation ecosystem. Because these, in fact, probably we have used them here in Malawi mostly, you know, uh, you know, on the regulatory side of innovations. Uh, because, you know, it's like, uh, you know, is it like you say that faith-based community X has endorsed this particular one, this particular innovation, this particular technology, and whatever that have you. Uh, but I think we need to do more than that. Uh, let's, let's involve them in both, on both sides. The development side, as well as the, uh, what, as well as, well as the, uh, as well as what, on, on the, uh, on the regular side. In fact, I think uh, there are quite a few faith-based uh, communities that actually, uh, you know, have, or, you know, that, 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 that have got innovations in this, in this own country. Mind you, Innovation is not just a new product, in physical product. It can also be a service, you know, uh, or, or maybe of, of doing something, or you can, it's an improvement. And there are, there are examples from a lot of faith-based communities where they have actually been part and parcel 
uh, of some of that. Um, Professor Jota works on the Chirwa. I'm sure I'm still working on the Chirwa, Professor Jota. Um, and you see, I remember that uh, when there was Lecturer Basin, is it the Chirwa Basin project? Actually, our colleagues of the Muslim faith, they were strong advocates for environmental uh, protection. You know, they were, actually, they were there to come up with, you know, sections in the Quran that speaks to what? To, I mean, uh, to conservation. The importance of a tree and whatever, and what have you. I mean, uh, so really, we need to bring them to the table. I mean, they are quite, quite, quite important. Thank you. Maybe let me just touch on another question. Steps of engaging with the, you know, parliamentarians or whatever it is. Uh, I'm quite optimistic myself because, you know what? Uh, several years back in Malawi, there was a vice chancellor, you know, in public universities, there was a vice chancellor. But today, we are talking of vice chancellors. So actually, as they are, they are a community. I'm sure they are a force to actually, you know, uh, you know, influence their agenda. So I think we have an opportunity here, I mean, as a country, we now have six public universities plus private universities. I mean, these are senior colleagues. These are colleagues who have seen things on the ground. I mean, they are, you know, a constituency that is a voice, especially when it comes to implementing uh, the national research agenda of this country. I've gone through it, and they, I, think, I think there's a strong, 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 strong space there for our vice chancellors and their partners, domestically and international, to really move the university and contribute uh, to really implement that, that, that agenda. You can't do everything. At least your small contribution goes a long way. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our time is fast spent. I'll just take one question, and then we have the speakers pass over the information and we have we follow up after the lecture uh, just one question there was a lady she has been <laughs> thank, thank you very much my name is Barbara Glover I am the program manager of the integrated vector management program at AD and EPART. Um, I have questions for the two speakers. Uh, well, it's the same question um, to Prof. Mbali and uh, Prof. Richard. Um, so Prof. Mbali, you had made presentations around uh, diplomacy, governance, and priority setting, and uh, Prof. Richard on food security. Considering that there are um, quite a number of universities in this audience, when it comes to reskilling or um, generating new skills in young people to be able to address some of the issues that you brought up. What would you recommend as uh, new courses, new training modules, new um, skills that these un uh, universities in Malawi should consider? Um, reason being that uh, the truth is, I, I don't think up to 50% of those in this room here would be present in 2063. The people who will be present are not in this room right now. And it's important that we hand out the knowledge that we are sharing here to the people who would actually be there to witness the implementation. And, um, and, and so it's important then that we have our educational systems adjusted to, to be able to reflect some of these uh, conversations. So what would you recommend as a, is it new courses? Is it um, added modules that should that university should consider to ensure that the rich knowledge that you've shared here today can be translated into our educational system? Thank you. Quickly, give us the answer, and then we we'll get the closing remarks. Thank you. I, I think I think that's part of the ongoing debate right now in terms of how do we make our universities you know, entrepreneurial, uh, you know, to begin to focus on entrepreneurship. And there are a few universities which are beginning to move in that direction that are, you know, every student coming into the university goes through some training on entrepreneurship uh, because uh, the rate of unemployment is so high, I mean, across Africa, not just Malawi, where our graduates, you know, are without a job, you know, for maybe three, four years. You know, so how can we actually, you know, begin to give them skills, even while at the university, uh, both in terms of uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, 
our curriculum is changed in such a way that uh, every student, you know, begins to prepare, you know, herself or himself for, you know, be, being, you know, a, an employer, you know, who can employ others or generate jobs. Um, I, I know, I mean, talking to uh, the Vice Chancellor of Luana, uh, there's quite a bit of movement in that direction, uh, including setting up even business incubation uh, hubs, and not just at the university, but also setting up business incubation hubs in communities. Uh, we went together to see the Minister of uh, Youth and Sports, and uh, indeed Luana was offered a place in Neno to, to begin to set up a business incubation hub right there in Neno on uh, agri-food systems. And I think as the universities, I think this outreach component is extremely important. How do we make sure that uh, we actually are out there visible in uh, Kameme, in Chitipa, you know, including uh, our, you know, health practitioners. I mean, how do we really, you know, get out to communities and be part of that community and probably provide, you know, a new experience for these uh, students to, to really begin to um, reach out and build uh, this entrepreneurship spirit, uh, reach out to schools, reach out to faith-based organizations, um, reach out to the military. You know, I, again, I mean, we, we need sometimes to be bold and be, you know, um, get out to those institutions which we feel, you know, sometimes people just fear, oh, why should I go and meet the commander of the army, you know, and introduce, uh, you know, this new idea. You know, if you feel they're going to be your allies, be bold, you'll be amazed at how they will welcome you as scientists to say, yes, let's work together on uh, building this uh, bridge or a new technology around uh, construction or whatever technology you have, you know. Because one, they bring in legitimacy, they bring a certain amount of power uh, into your work or additional legitimacy into your work. So I think that innovative thinking also in terms of who do you bring on board as your ally, including these faith-based organizations, some of them may be very powerful in influencing certain you know, decisions or indeed you know, uh, innovations. They should be approached and get, get engaged as well. Thank you. I'd like to invite, okay, Professor Agri has a brief comment on that. I agree with Professor Mkandawid. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Professor Ayan, would you kindly come and give closing remarks? Thank you. Hey, well, okay. let's see if this microphone works. It sounds like it's a bit better. Um, uh, wow. Uh, I think. I didn't overbuild the presentations, quite the opposite. I think we've heard such wisdom and insight um, uh, and a lot of commonality but also complementarity, I think, from uh, uh, the points that we've heard and a lot of engagement from the audience, both uh, uh, here in Blantyre and at home in Dundee. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't have the chance to address all of the questions. Um, one year on from signing the Blantyre Summit, the Blantar Declaration, rather, um, and to come back to what does equitable partnership look like? And that equitable partnership, I think, is exactly what we've heard described uh, over the last uh, hour and a half. Uh, a lot of the answers have to be in our hands. Um, as the, the, you know, the last questioner made the point, many of us, and that includes me, won't be here in 2063, even with even with modern medicine and genomics, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, and we need to ensure that we pass on our legacy to you and to our younger generations to come in perhaps a better way than uh, we found it over the last 20 years ourselves. I think you've got the capacity to do it, um, certainly my institution, but also many others uh, around the world. I like to say there's only one us, and we are all part of that us. So, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you in Dundee for um, uh, being part of the conversation. And uh, here in Blantyre, please join me in congratulating and thanking our two speakers. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for your patience from the beginning to end and for being actively involved. distinguished speakers for the knowledge imparted. Thank you so much. 
we hope this will be taken on offline because everything could not be covered. Thank you.